your interest and how you chose the topics for your dissertation. And then how has having, a, having earned a doctorate in mathematics uh, affected your life in the last 20 years? And can I make one correction before I let you start talking? This is Dr. Tasha L. and this Dr. Sherry Scott and Dr. Kimberly Williams. I was intending to say that and I'm sorry I forgot. You earned it, you deserve it. So Sherry, you wanna start with the, your background? Right, right, right. So my topic I believe was chosen by my advisor or he introduced me to the topic. Um, but you know, it had all the elements that I was interested in. It had the harmonic analysis and the wavelet theory. So the, the pure math, the abstract math, and it had the signal analysis applications, signal processing application. And then it also had a uh, deterministic and probabilistic statistical point of view. So everything coming together that kept me interested and engaged uh, and excited about the topic. But I will say um, in general though, as far as math is concerned, I had some great teachers along the way. So I'm talking before, before I even got to uh, undergrad, I had some great teachers along the way, a lot of um, teachers who, who kept me interested in math and I think most importantly, I had the exposure to the math that I needed in order to navigate the system. So I went to uh, a large university, The Ohio State University, for my undergrad. And being able to navigate there, although they had a great program, they had an honors program, but I think being able to maintain, to, to keep moving forward, it was important that my background had been solidified. You know, I, I had calculus when I was in high school. So I had the exposure uh, so that I was able to maintain. And I think that's very important. Kimberly? Uh, so like Sherry, um, I credit my advisor for introducing me to the area of statistical models for count data. Um, and so when I say count data, I'm, talk I'm really talking about counts. So you might be interested in the number of vaccines um, being delivered to different states you know, each month. Um, or the number of hurricanes uh, in the Atlantic. So these are the types of data that, that I study and um, I consider um, distributions. You know, what, what are the best distributions to understand the behavior of the data and to explain or predict the data? Perhaps there are other factors that can be used to um, understand, understand these data. Uh, so in the real world, um, you know, when you're trying to understand the data, uh, and I hope my students, some of my students are watching. Um, you know, they're not like these textbook problems where the distributions that we learn about in intro stats uh, actually work. Uh, we might have to tweak them a little bit. And so I look at um, variations, more flexible models, um, flexible distributions that we can use to understand the behavior of count data. And I feel like I've, I've come full circle in this because um, I learned about five years ago that one of our fellow math um, uh, graduates, uh, Kimberly Sellers at Georgetown University also studies um, statistical models for count data. And so for the past five years or so, we have been collaborating. And so it's been really great that um, I'm still working in the area that I worked, um, worked on for my dissertation. Um, I'm you know, looking at uh, some different distributions and asking some different questions, but now I've had the opportunity to work with someone who I studied with um, in grad school. So it's really, it's really been a great. Um, and also you ask about uh, our doctorate. Why don't you, why don't you wait and since Sherry didn't answer that, don't let- Oh, sure, okay. absolutely. Tasha, how about the background, how you got into, what you, how you chose your area? Okay, so um, thank you, Dr. J. <clears throat> so, my advisor, Michael Ball, co-director the National Center of Excellence for Aviation Operations Research. So um, we work closely with the FAA. So the topic was one that was of interest to the FAA and to uh, Nextor. And so for those of you who don't know about operations research, um, you know, it's basically about mathematical modeling of real world systems in order to optimize um, and to, uh, to model, improve, and, and optimize real world systems. So aviation operations research is basically OR related to, um, to aviation. And so 
what was so fascinating was that, you know, real world problems. And, and when I'll say this, what's cool about the three of us is that we kind of, uh, Kim, Sherry and I, we kind of have like different aspects of the mathematical sciences. So I was, I was primarily, you know, applied, Kim was primarily statistics and, you know, Sherry was primarily um, abstract, but they had elements of all in, in all of our work. So with the aviation operations research, so essentially what I did was develop these statistical models to help uh, figure out how many planes can land in an airport when there's bad weather. And the reason why this was important is because weather is constantly changing. And so it was difficult to figure out, okay, what should be the runway configuration in terms of how many planes uh, can land. And so I used a lot of OR, uh, specifically integer programming, as well as statistics um, to do the modeling. And one of the cool things that that happened was uh, one of my dissertation committee members uh, exposed me to this area called data mining. Um, and that's basically trying to find patterns and trends in data. And so at the start of my dissertation work, I used data mining to figure out, okay, when you have all of these different weather conditions, then how does that translate into the capacity of an airport or the number of flights that can land? Um, and so it was really exciting and I am indebted to um, my advisor for, um, for uh, letting me be part of Nextdoor and work on this. Okay, so this time we go in the reverse order, Tasha and then Kim and Sherry. It's been 20 years since you've had the doctorate. Can you tell us how that having a doctorate has affected your life? Positively or for negatively? Okay. Hopefully I positively. <laughs> For, for the most part, positive. You know, um, one of the things that you had asked was you had asked for us to um, introduce ourselves. And so I really, because this is important. Um, so who am I? I am an applied mathematician that grew up in a very loving and supportive family in New Orleans. They, you know, exemplified uh, importance of education, being kind, uh, treating others with respect, having a strong faith and, um, and excelling or doing your very best in all that you undertake. So I just wanna say I am a proud uh, graduate of a historically black college or university, Xavier University of Louisiana, which is a family school. And then I am proud to say that I currently work at an HBCU Spelman College. So how has, and I, so I want to do that introduction because that's part of, of who I am and led up to, I think, where I am today. But how has it impacted my life over the last 20 years? Well, you know, the vision I had for my life was that I always just wanted to teach math on the college level because I love math and I love helping people to understand it. And I really wanted to teach calculus too. When I was in college, I wrote this essay about the beauty of integration. I know people are like, okay, you know, for people who are in college and taking Cal too. So, um, and so I really wanted to teach that. And so I didn't have a vision of anything beyond that. And I did not realize that having a doctoral degree would really open doors and present new opportunities. Um, and so, because of being uh, active in professional organizations and participating in conferences, I've had the opportunity to work at the National Science Foundation as well as the professional organization um, uh, Informs, uh, which was uh, really, really cool. And so I think that if I were to give advice to students is, you know, just be open because you never know, you may plan your path or what you want to do, but, you know, things could change. And of course, uh, work hard and find mentors, advocates and sponsors um, and don't give up, uh, persevere and um, know that all experiences make you stronger. And I'll say this last thing, to be forgiving. Um, you know, we are in the age of 2020 and there are going to be things that are challenging and they're gonna be things that happen that are unfair, but just don't let it deter you. You know, you always do what's right. You work hard and you just keep pressing on. 
Kim? Okay. Um, well, in terms of how the doctorate has uh, impacted my life, I will say that um, as a graduate of Spelman College, um, you know, pursuing my PhD, that was, uh, that was an expectation. Pursuing graduate school, I'll say, was an expectation. Um, I certainly uh, have wonderful professors there who really encouraged me and uh, wonderful role models there. Um, so um, pursuing uh, the PhD in math was just some, an expectation of um, being a math major. And I was exposed um, not only to faculty members there, but also um, alumni who, had co who would come back to the department and speak with us um, about being a graduate student um, and being a PhD student in mathematics. So as Tasha mentioned, definitely um, having a PhD has opened doors. Um, I have worked for the Department of Defense. Um, I've been a visiting scholar at the University of Alicante in Spain. Uh, I've worked at a large research university at NC State. And currently I am at um, historically black university, um, North Carolina Central. And so just um, being able to just have different types of opportunities, um, that's one thing that having a PhD um, will do um, allow you allow allow you flexibility, and um, I do hope that um, anyone who is thinking about uh, majoring in math, thinking about pursuing a career in mathematics, I hope um, that um, these people, those people, will realize that um, uh, the possibilities are limitless, and you really do have a lot of a lot of options. Siri. All right, so I agree, you know, mathematics gives you the options that can allow you to go in a lot of different ways. I, I've been in academia as well, so as a professor, I've held uh, to meetings and conferences and taken my children, I've been able to take my children to meetings and conferences and my granny nannies, I had my mom and her friend uh, traveled with us once to, to uh, Austria, to Vienna. And those meetings and conferences and meeting those exciting people and having collaborations and, you know, I've had collaborators that are engineers, oceanographers, I work with oceanographers, kind of crazy cool. And um, people who work with uh, medical data. And now I'm working with, uh, with biomass, infectious disease models on COVID-19. So it does, it gives you, you know, I've been able to, to do a variety of things and work with a variety of very interesting people and, and working on a problem or two here and there. And, and, and of course, teaching and mentoring some beautiful young minds. It's been great, it's been a great ride. Very challenging, but fun. fun. Okay, the second question is, the percentage of black women with PhDs is still relatively small. So aside from your great ability, which I am very familiar with, what factors help make you make it possible for you to get through the maze that is the PhD program? So Kim, why don't we start this time and uh, then Sherry and Tasha. Oh, you're you're muted. Okay. There we go. Um, certainly having strong family support uh, definitely makes a difference. Um, you know, from my parents and siblings and godparents and um, really just had my back throughout the entire process. Um, I've talked a lot about my, my mom who was really my, the first example, the first role model of a black woman in STEM. Uh, she taught life science and math at middle school and um, at the high school level. And you know, she always made sure that we incorporated um, some type of STEM activity in our family vacations and there were lots of books around and um, her lab was my, that was my playroom um, after school. So certainly I will say, you know, really I, I had strong support from family and then certainly attending Spelman College. Um, I would say that was really when I started seeing myself as a mathematician and uh, I just, I, again, I had so many role models. Um, and now I look back on it. I didn't realize it at the time, just how that, that just wasn't the experience of so many other black college students. Um, but I had so many role models um, at Spelman. Um, and you know, I could, I could see myself as a mathematician. Um, Dr. Glass, Dr. Bozeman, Dr. Shaw, you know, women of color. 
um, Dr. Patterson. And not only did they mentor me at Spelman, but they also mentored me throughout graduate school and into my career. Um, I also mentioned a uh, strong cohort of peers at Spelman. Um, there already had established a track. There was a track that was already established um, of math majors going to PhD programs. And, um, and so it was great to be part of that cohort. Um, I'll mention um, Karen King, uh, who really I followed in her footsteps. Um, was a graduate of Spelman College, a math major who uh, went to the University of Maryland, started in the math department and finished in math education. Uh, I followed her to, to Maryland. And then when she got her um, first job uh, at San Diego State, I was still a graduate student. And when I um, uh, attended a conference in San Diego, she came and picked me up and showed me around San Diego and just always had that um, mentoring, that constant um, mentoring. And then of course my mentors um, at Maryland, we had mentors from uh, postdocs, department chair, um, fellow students, um, staff members. Uh, so there were just so many people involved in, in my success that I owe thanks to. Jerry? Yeah, um, so right, so following up on the same thing, I think we probably are all kind of sitting in the same same boat. I mean, it was those those mentors, those models that we had. When I was growing up, when I was in high school, my mom went back and got a, her PhD at the Ohio State University, and I was so I was like an academia brat. Academic brat. So I kind of hung out at, at the university when I was uh, in high school. So you know, I was kind of exposed to that kind of lifestyle. And education has always been important. But I think I think for my doctorate degree at, at University of Maryland, um, the, there were two things that if I, if I could narrow it down, I would say that I, that I needed and that I would advise anyone else to have. And that is, um, what you, I, I don't see how you could do math if you don't have a love for it, right? It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy. So you gotta have a love and interest for it. But then also you have to balance that off with some resources, some mentors, cohort groups, student groups, who can then assist you, right? So you have to have, I think there's two things. You have to have a love and interest, and then also some resources they can use to help you get through those hard times. So that's it. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of hard work. Um, but I don't think it's something that you do necessarily all by yourself. You do have to go into your own place and work out the problem, but then you also have to discuss the problem with other people. And, and then maybe someone has an insight that you just had not thought of yet. And so, you know, I think it's the two. Right, an interest, hard work, um, and then also some resources, mentoring, tutors, uh, just someone to talk to about what you're doing. Tasha? Thank you, Dr. J. And so I'm just gonna have to co-sign to what uh, Kim and Sherry said, um, definitely a strong support system. And like Kim and Sherry, you know, my mother is an inspiration. She also went back to school to get her PhD when I was in high school. Um, she actually uh, got her degree in sociology um, 10 years before my brother and I got our PhDs in the same year. Um, so, you know, having that strong family support and encouragement, um, all of my dad's brothers and sisters, my grandmothers, my grandfather, our godmother, um, teachers and mentors. And I have to say, I, I owe a lot to my professors from Xavier. I did not have, in all of my formal education, I never had a Black woman professor, but I did have a lot of supportive and encouraging professors. So, you know, I'm thinking about Lester Jones and Dr. Unithin and Dr. Fontova um, and you know, I can go on and on, but, you know, having mentors, having teachers, because what I find is that when you're in math, um, we all know that it's hard, right? And so we want to do all we can to, to help you stay the course. And so that's what I've found. The other thing um, that I think was really impactful was having the David and Lucille Packard Foundation Scholarship. And that's where I met my best friend, um, Dion Price, um, we both met right after college. She went to Norfolk State, of course. I went to Xavier University of Louisiana. 
Um, and so we met there and, you know, we kind of supported and encouraged each other through our master's program. So I'm happy to say now that she was the first Black to get a PhD in biostatistics from Emory University, also in 2000. Um, and so I think that that she has been, I mean, it's been great to have someone else go through some of the challenges um, that I went through. Um, my friends in math from Xavier, my community, um, Heidi, Iris, and Anessa, and then com our community of mathematicians. I think both Sherry and Kim said this. And so, you know, at the time when Dr. J was the chair of the department, we had the largest number of African Americans pursuing advanced degrees in math in the country. And I just, we thought that it would be really great. Um, to just show you just a snapshot, just a subset of the Black women who were a part of our community. Um, one of these Black women actually was doing a postdoc at Maryland when we were there, and that's Dawn Lott. And so on this slide, you'll see um, I have uh, good friends, colleagues, mentors, former students. I have former students that have PhDs now. Um, so it's it's really amazing, but I also want to highlight um, two of our members who um, unfortunately are not with us anymore, um, Angela Grant and Karen King, and Kim talked about Karen King, and she really did start, she started the process um, for all of us really followed her example. We followed her to Maryland. She was a great role model and um, we really wanted to be like her. So I, I have to, we owe this to Dr. Johnson because he is the reason why there were so many of us and he understood the, the value of community and the impact of it. And so um, we just, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so proud of, 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 of um, our, our community. So, and these are these are phenomenal women doing phenomenal things. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and I, I don't want to talk too much longer, is about the National Association of Mathematicians. Um, Abby, I'm, I'm, we're good on the slide, but I have to talk about NAM. NAM is how I first saw a black woman in math. I had never. I had never met or known a black woman in math until I went to NAMM's undergraduate math fest. And that's also where I met Dr. Johnson who actually uh, tutored me in advanced calculus from afar. Um, so, you know, NAMM has been a community and so supportive. And so because of all, all the people that have poured into us, all the other black ma mathematicians that have paved the way, you know, I felt as if it was my responsibility to pay it forward. And so that's why it was important to mentor other women of color. And that's why I wanted to teach at Spelman. I wanted to do undergrad research with students and it's, it's really an honor. So um, that's, I think, what helped to facilitate the success. Okay, so before I ask the last question, let me say that Karen King was indeed the first of the Spelman women that I recruited to come to the University of Maryland. And unfortunately, she died last year much too early. Angela Grant was one of your classmates who came to Maryland as a graduate student and then was diagnosed with breast cancer and yet nevertheless finished her PhD, had started on her career again before she died way too early. And then the other person that I wanted to mention who had died recently had a big impact on your lives and my life as well was Dolores Forbes, who was our Director of Administrative Affairs, the first Black woman to hold that position in the entire university. And you could go talk to her about anything, and so could the faculty, and so could any of the other students, but she was just a rock in the whole community. Okay, well, if you, uh, last question then is, uh, 2020 has been a very unusual year. Uh, there's been renewed attention to systemic racism, and we're in, it seems like we're in the middle of racial reckoning. So thinking back on your days when you were in grad school, do you think the climate for African Americans in grad school has improved? And I'll give anyone a chance to start. Come on, Sherry. Yes, 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 and no. Can I do that? Can I say yes okay. and no? Uh, you know, I want to be positive and there are positive parts, right? There are some programs, uh, such as the one that I'm involved with at Mathematical Science Research Institute in Berkeley, MSRI, the adjoint program, the African Diaspora Joint Mathematics Workshop, 
which works to, to get uh, African-American mathematicians involved in research at different levels, and that's been great. Uh, and there are similar programs such as that. And there is somewhat of a pipeline, I'm, I'm still hoping, uh, for mathematical sciences. However, right, in mainstream, um, majority institutions, uh, it's still it's still very much a struggle. It's still very much a struggle. I, I still am only seeing one or two black students, maybe maybe a semester, right? And maybe a quarter. So it's still it's still um, very concerning, right? It's still uh, pretty dire. So yes and no. Yes, there are programs. Yes, there are some some places where there's, there's hope, right? There's always hope, but I, I am particularly concerned about the pipelines as well. So that's one of the reasons why you know, I was saying, I think a lot of our students are getting to college and they don't have the background that they need in order to navigate the system. They don't have that, that exposure to the math that they need. And even if you have the exposure, it's hard, but you know, having the exposure then makes it just a little bit easier to navigate. So I am quite concerned. Um, about the pipeline and, and what's happening. Concerned, but hopeful. So yes and no. <laughs> Tasha, Kim, what you think? Go on, Tasha, what do you think? I was gonna let Kim go. She <laughs> unmuted <laughs> first. <laughs> no, I mean, I'll chime in on this one. Yeah. Yeah, Sherry's right. I mean, I do believe the climate has improved, but there's certainly a lot more work to be done. Um, uh, Tasha mentioned NAM, um, and certain, you know, I benefited so much from attending NAM Math Fest as an undergraduate. I attended as a graduate student. Um, I attended, attended once I started um, my faculty position. Um, and so NAM has always been at the forefront um, of addressing these issues. I, and as Sherry mentioned, you know, we are starting to see more programming and or, um, programs at uh, national conferences or annual conferences um, that address diversity and equity. And I think that's great to have um, uh, these themes um, woven into um, just our, our regular um, discipline specific conferences. But there definitely is more work to be done. Um, I agree, uh, students uh, need more resources. Um, they need to feel like they belong in math. They need to feel comfortable in math. Um, there, need to be, there should be more um, extracurricular activities. I certainly benefited from um, having extracurricular uh, activities. Now, Sherry, you mentioned that you took, you took calculus um, in high school. You know, the highest math that my high school offered at the time was pre-calculus. Um, and so I'm very fortunate that I was able to attend um, some summer programs between my junior and senior year, um, years of high school, um, and also participate in like a, a math quiz bowl um, at my high school that allowed me to travel to um, nearby colleges to uh, just uh, compete on weekends, um, answering questions. Um, and that exposed me um, to some um, more math than what I would have seen in my in my high school right and it's an exposure that's key right it really exactly. is exactly. It, it is it is yeah. oh, because so that's when in, in colleges you know when i learned about or i first learned about information theory and entropy and you know graph theory so it's it's just being exposed so a lot of times for students of color it's not a thing about intelligence it's just the thing about not having been exposed and so I do agree that you want to have activities that expose students to different things giving them different um, math-based experiences I think is critical um, so you all want me to answer the question so the question was um, have things improved? What I'll say are they're improving, but I agree with <laughs> my, my uh, sisters in math that there is still a lot to be done. Um, and, you know, there's still a lot of, of, of people that can make a difference. And when I was thinking about this question, you know, I was really thinking about students and I was thinking about, you know, when I was a student in college and I didn't even know what it meant to get a PhD or to be a college professor. Um, and I've had students that were still facing some of the same 
racism and sexism and microaggressions that that we may have faced. So I, I, I thought about the students and I, I want to say this to you. I really do. We know well, so well, how exhausting it can be trying to always represent your race and your gender with excellence and acclimating and accommodating in predominantly white spaces. We know that well. Um, but please hear me when I say this, you are worthy, you are more than capable and you are not an imposter. Um, you know, what, whatever your faith tradition, your spiritual walk, lean on that. Um, racism and discrimination are real. They are real in our society and in our institutions. They're gonna be barriers, obstacles, challenges. They're gonna be microaggressions from people who don't know you, but they make assumptions about who you are based on your race and gender, but you, you can't let it stop you. you. You have to just keep persevering, acknowledge it, acknowledge its, ex its existence, and then just keep it moving. Press on and please don't let it get in your spirit because, you know, you just have, there's so much work that we have to do and you just have to believe in yourself. Think about all your family, your teachers, your mentors who feel like you can do this. You know, think about others that paved the way um, that came before us. For us, I think about Dawn Lott and Camille McHale and Teresa Edwards and Rosalind Williams. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, you know, don't be scared about being the first um, or breaking the mold or uh, creating a path for others to follow. Be, be smart, be unashamedly smart, um, yet humble and be, be grateful for all your experiences and blessings. And so when I think about that question, I think about our students and, and I'll just say, you know, for, for, for us as black women, resilience is our middle name, right? So, you know, we, we experience tough times and then we just keep it moving. So I would just say, you know, um, it's improving. We're not there yet, we're getting there. Um, and, I, and I think it was, I think that was important for us at University of Maryland College Rock. And here comes Dr. J again, that was important. Dr. J, Dr. Johnson, had, had worked to get a cohort of us so that we had each other to talk to when we when we encountered this type of, of uh, racism, whatever uh, that we had. And um, so we had that cohort and we had Dr. Johnson and we knew that we, and Dr. Johnson had of course, others in, at, at University of Maryland who was working with him uh, in order to provide some assistance. And so we knew we were gonna encounter it. And when we did, we could talk about it and we could tell other people and then we could go back in and focus in on our work, right? So I think that's key. I mean, as, if there's anyone who's thinking about where to go to study, I think that's key, right? That you have to, if you choose an institution, if you're thinking about a graduate school to go to now, right, in math, I think it's important to find a place where you go, you visit, and you know that you have some people who are gonna fight those battles because those battles are gonna come. They're gonna come, regardless. For sure they're gonna come, but you gotta make sure you have someone who's gonna support you in that, who's gonna insulate you. And then you talk about it, you tell the people who knew you need to tell, and then you go back to your work, right? Because that's important. You have to be able to go back to your work, right? And not deal with that. You need someone else to fight for you outside. So I think that made the difference for us. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Dwayne, but can I just say that one of the things that happened at Maryland was an example of this kind of microaggression and two black students came independently to the graduate uh, director's office to report this incident. And the woman, Janet Cooper, was very smart because she realized they didn't come together. They didn't know each other. And so that's when we started the idea of we really just make, need to make sure that they know each other and know you can work within the black community as well as in the majority community. Dwayne, we turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, time is short, so we're going to get right to it. Um, there are many questions in the Q&A. Um, won't get to most of them already, I can tell you that. Uh, those who are interested, there is an upvote feature in there that some of you may want to look at the questions and try and at least call them. But I've uh, got a couple that I'll ask you. Some of them, a lot of the questions touch on things you've said already. So um, you may want to add a little bit to it. Maybe not everyone answer every question and uh, we'll get through what we can. Uh, the first one, I'm going to go um, right to the top one on the list here. 
uh, as contemporary hidden figures, what advice do you offer to black girls in elementary school, high school, and college so that they can join you in this field at the PhD level? Any back? Okay, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, well, I, I mentioned this before about looking for um, other activities to supplement um, what, you're, what you're getting uh, in the classroom. And I do think that's really important um, for you know, high school, middle and high school students looking for extracurricular um, activities, summer, summer activities, um, once you're in college, you know, internships, research opportunities. Um, I think that's very important. And then also um, finding mentors, that's a theme that's come up a lot, but really finding multiple mentors, mentors at different levels, peer mentors who can um, kind of uh, guide you, help you navigate. Uh, so that's very important, uh, I believe, to one success. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Scott, Dr. Ennis, anything to add that Dr. Weems didn't say already? So I probably already said this before, but I'll say it again. Exposure, exposure, and we all did. Exposure, exposure, exposure. The more math you see, the higher you can go, the further you can go, I think the better you are. Okay, thank and you. Find, find a community. Find, find a community because, you know, we, we, we are there to support each other to make it through. Right, thank you. Uh, the next one that is really bubbled up to the top, there's a cluster of questions for, um, uh, that involve change at the level, um, not advice to those below, but uh, advice to those above who would like to make a difference. Uh, so I'm gonna read from a couple of them. Uh, one, as department chair at an R1 institution, what concrete advice would you give to me and my faculty to help us make our graduate program a better experience for our black graduate students? Uh, black and, let me, and let me piggyback on that too, because uh, Dr. <laughs> Johnson, you may you're being asked to weigh in on this issue as well. Um, uh, what was the politics of you being intentional about diversifying math scholars? Did you have pushback from your department or university? How can you advise others to be so intentional? And what about the back and forth nature of institutional change? Okay, so with that, uh, yes, who was about to start answering? <laughs> I was gonna holler out, okay. hire black faculty, hire faculty, African-American faculty, uh, and have them in positions where they can make a difference, right? Not at men necessarily, but as professors. I think that's key. I think you have to have someone who can help in that capacity, for sure. And a cohort, of course. Ed? So I guess I would say pay attention. I mean, you do, to be intentional, you have to have an intention to bring students there. But then you have to have an intention to make sure that they have a good experience when they're. If you look at, there have been many successes. Lee Larch at Fisk produced while he was there, five African Americans wanting to get a PhD, none before, none since. If you look at Clarence Stevens at Potsdam, they all created a community. They all paid attention to what the students' needs were and they were all successful. So I think if you pay attention, it can be done. Thank as you. As far as the administration is concerned, can I say? Yes, please. They were happy to take credit and unwilling to take, do anything to help. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one more before turning over to closing remarks. Um, this one is. Um, says, did you ever, this back to the um, three, the three doctors, uh, the, um, uh, did you ever encounter a mathematics course that made you, that almost made you go, well, this isn't for me, I guess, or feel imposter syndrome? And if so, what did you do to overcome that discouraging feeling? Any of you? I don't know if there was a specific course, but I, I do remember those qualifying exams <laughs> very well <laughs> and just getting through them. And yes, I'll admit that, you know, I had to retake a qualifying exam. And so uh, that's just um, when that reality hits you and you realize that, oh, I've got to study over winter break and, <laughs> and uh, get ready to do that, that, you know, you have to really uh, pull together your strength and not let yourself get discouraged. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember 
I remembered that experience really well because um, actually a number of us were studying for the you know qualifying exams at that point, and we made we made the best of it. We uh, we organized uh, exercise sessions and we rallied around each other. It actually snowed, and so <laughs> we weren't even <laughs> sure if we were going to be able to take our exam. But you have to um, again, you know, it's relying on the support your support system. And um, so it might be a little discouraging, um, but you think about what you're there for, realize what your goal is, and persevere. Thank you. And uh, would either one or the other of you like to speak before we come? Uh, Dr. Scott, Dr. Ennis? Either. If not, okay. Same thing, same thing she said, work hard, help, help each other, yeah. Okay, all right, good. And with that, it is 445, but before we go, um, I don't get the last word here. Uh, we'll go alphabetically, Dr. Ennis, Dr. Scott, Dr. Wings, uh, just whatever closing remarks you would like to, um, uh, closing remarks you'd like to make. And let me say to the audience, uh, lots of great questions in here. Sorry, we can't get to most of them. So if you also would like to add, I don't know if you want to put an email address in the chat, if people have, I mean, there's lots of people with lots on their minds. So if you want to do that, you can say how people could reach you beyond today. Uh, Dr. Ennis. Um, so. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. And, um, you know, you were a postdoc at Maryland, so you influenced us in a very positive way as well. Um, so please do. We are more than happy to answer questions that you have. So um, we'll put in our email address and uh, reach out to you. So in terms of final words, um, I want to thank, first of all, um, Spelman College Office of Communications and Jasmine Burton, again, the AMS and NAM, um, our mentors, Dr. Ray Johnson, Dr. Dwayne Cooper. And so the title of this was Moving Mathematics Forward. And what I would say as a closing remark is that together we all can move math forward, right? If nothing else COVID-19 has taught us, we are all in this together. Um, and so maintain uh, inner fortitude and fearless faith. And you know, fearless is Maryland's motto. So um, that, that would be my, my closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Remarks, closing remarks. Uh, so, um, right. So, 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 it, mathematics is a beautiful, beautiful area of study. It has a lot of consequences and ramifications in a lot of different ways. There are lots and lots of beautiful problems to study. We can make so much. Uh, 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 progress in studying in many things, cancer, uh, climate change, COVID. There's so many problems to be done, so much to be, to be solved, so much to be figured out that it's a shame that there's, that, that the system, the, the, the STEM, STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, mathematics are still predominantly white male. That, that makes no sense. Right? Because there's so many problems to do, and there's so much to learn, and there's so much to figure out. So, I mean, if that's your interest, do it. Do it. Find some way to do it and find a place where you can find support in doing that. All right. Thank you. And Dr. Wings. Well, I, I really want to make sure that I um, take the opportunity to thank my advisor, Paul Smith. Uh, I, I sometimes joke and say that we used to have marathon meetings because we would meet um, sometimes for hours, and I'm talking <laughs> two to three hours. And as a faculty member, I, I, I realize now just how precious that time is. Um, and so just you know, working through derivations and proofs, um, very grateful for that support as well as a support structure um, that, I, uh, that we all had at Maryland um, with our peers, um, with postdocs, with our um, department chair, Dr. Johnson at the time. Um, and certainly I'm very grateful for um, my journey uh, through Spelman College. And I am just trying to um, uh, inspire students like you all, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Cooper, and my peers inspired me. So now at North Carolina Central, I hope to um, follow in your footsteps and, 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 and do the work and inspire my students like you did for me. So thank you. So Dwayne, can I just say one thing? 
I think I am even more proud of the ladies today than I was 20 years ago. They've been matured into wonderful mathematicians. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you. And that's the last word.